Next, we will hear from Ms. Helen Lamp. Helen uh, will be speaking on gender systems and national security. Helen Lamb is an MA candidate in the Statecraft and International Affairs uh, track at the Institute of World Politics with a concentration in American foreign policy, and she is graduating this May. Helen is a Mount Vernon Fellow at the Center for American Greatness and a Publius Fellow at the Claremont Institute. She publishes a weekly column at American Greatness on topics related to culture and politics. Helen. In case you haven't, is this good? All right. In case you haven't noticed, American society is increasingly obsessed with the concept of gender. In 2019 America, you could walk into any dingy student lounge in any given higher institution of higher learning and likely pick up something about the infinite fluidity of gender, identity, or maybe even how the cis-hetero patriarchy is the source of all evil. Gender theory, as it's called, incubated in the halls of the academy, pioneered by the likes of Kate Millett and Margaret Mead, takes for granted that a person's sex and gender are distinct entities, and that the latter is merely an expression of a disembodied identity of the expressor's choice. The field of gender studies is a world of ambiguity, hypocrisy, and conspiracy, and as a result, serious people dealing with high-stakes topics tend to regard the field as superfluous. On the other hand, American national security professionals and military strategists approach their fields with um, a level of scientific rigor that can sometimes neglect cultural questions and often dispenses with the gender question because, of course, the gender industry rarely engages in honest inquiry about the topic. If one was to take a serious view of things, one would have to acknowledge immutable differences between men and women. Any field that denies this basic reality removes itself from high-stakes discussions. No need to let ideology blind us from reality. It's a shame that gender benders, gender deniers, and the generally gender-obsessed monopolize the conversation on sex in society because it is undeniable that courtship, love, and marriage have a profound impact on both the individual and the extended order. The way in which nations... Oh, this slide was supposed to be for that whole spiel, but... <laughs> um, the way in which nations, nations determine basic roles for male and female behavior, maintain sexual mores, and enforce the result, what I've termed gender systems, is absolutely essential to the health of the nation at large. Serious flaws in that most basic grouping of people, man and woman, beget serious flaws in the complex groups they inhabit. Today, I intend to speak frankly about how various gender systems in various cultures, namely the Far East, the Middle East, and the West, have serious implications for the security system at large. In the end, I hope we can dive into the future a bit and think about how we in the West may save ourselves from the imminent gender-based disaster of our times. In Book 1, Part 2 of Politics, Aristotle said, He who considers things in their first growth and origin, whether a state or anything else, will obtain the clearest view of them. In the first place, there must be a union of those who cannot exist without each other, namely of male and female, that the race may continue. I bring this quote up simply to justify what has been a fairly obvious fact of life for centuries, but bears repeating. The family is the most basic, fundamental, vital unit of society. It is a system of order unto itself, predicated on the relation of man and woman, sanctioned by natural law, a system of interdependent, interdependent parts with a unity of purpose and an internal division of labor. Keeping this in mind, we can use three key family-related demographic indicators to judge the health of the nation. Commonly referred to as vital rates, these are the marriage rate, the fertility rate, and the infant mortality rate, which I will amend slightly. The marriage rate refers to the number of people per 1,000 per year in a given population, usually country, um, that is getting married. The marriage rate in a given society relies on courtship rituals, social mores, and legal institutions and definitions of marriage. 
High rates of marriage are usually found in places where courtship rituals imply that marriage is an outcome of the courtship itself, and in places of high religiosity. On an individual level, monogamous marriage correlates with greater lifetime happiness. Children of married parents do better in school, have lower instances of depression and physical health problems, tend to stay out of jail, and are more financially stable than their more often than not fatherless counterparts. On the other hand, unmarried people are more prone to mental health issues and early death. This is especially true for men in both monogamous and polygamous societies, but especially the latter. Polygamy is one great cultural disruptor of marriage for many reasons. Firstly, culturally and legally enforced monogamy results in a fairly even distribution of marriage unions across a society. An uneven distribution of partnerships, um, or partners rather, means that there will be a significant <coughs> group of people, men or women, who are doomed to carry on unmarried. When this group of outcasts consists of men whose more potent sexual urges find no fulfillment in a wife, rates of violence, rape, and prostitution abound. Um, additionally, in a polygamous society, the age of marriage tends to be lower for females than in monogamous societies. With a relative scarcity of possible mates of their own age, men seek wives among women of younger <coughs> ages. Child marriage <coughs> becomes an issue. And according to one study, the larger the age gap, the more likely it is that a husband will kill his wife and vice versa. This suggests that polygamy is relatively much more dangerous for a society than monogamy. Polygamous, mar polygamous marriages tend to produce more children than monogamous relationships, but the poor education of the young mothers involved, um, social conflicts between co-wives, and the inability of the children to access and interact with otherwise occupied fathers whose time is dispersed sometimes among 24 children um, creates a less stable home environment for these children, children in societies. Next we have the fertility rate. Following marriage, there's the fertility rate, hopefully. Um, the fertility rate can be defined as the average number of children that would be born per woman if all women lived till the, till the end of their childbearing years and bore children according to a given fertility rate at each age. The replacement fertility rate of birth is 2.1 children per woman, one child to replace each parent, plus 0.1 of a child in case of emergency. If on average a, a nation's fertility rate is at replacement levels, the population is stable. Extremely low fertility rates in nations and various sub-demographics within those nations for many sociologists indicate malaise, but are often actually an outcome of increased wealth. Lower birth rates also coincide with gender egalitarianism as women in the workforce tend to delay their reproductive function in favor of their economic function. The richer, more educated, and more culturally cosmopolitan a nation becomes, the fewer children the average woman in those nations produce. Religiosity, as, a, as it correlates with high marriage rates, also correlates with above average fertility rates. Next we have the infant mortality rate. Traditionally, we think of uh, the infant mortality rate as a measure of how many infants per 1,000 births die during or soon after childbirth for various health-related reasons. Across the world, this kind of infant mortality has been going down for years thanks to scientific advancements in antibiotics. But I'd like to point out that there is another kind of infant mortality the presence of which indicates something slightly different than the traditional kind, but all the while says something horrible about the gender system of a population. This, of course, is abortion, essentially voluntary infant mortality. If we were to include this metric in the infant mortality rate for many countries, but especially, ironically, the most highly developed ones, the rate today would be positively pre-modern. Uh, within the fertility or birth rate, there is a gender distribution of new births. In the absence of manipulation, uh, this gender distri distribution of new births, also known as the sex ratio, matches the population sex ratio. And they are remarkably constant, but small alterations do occur natu uh, naturally. For example, a small excess of male births has been reported to occur during wartime, which I found very interesting. But the increased availability of sex-selective abortion, combined with the tradition of son preference, 
however, has distorted these natural sex ratios in large parts of Asia and North Africa. In many countries, the av availability of abortion, of abortion and sex detection technology has enabled, enabled people to act out their misogyny, kill their baby girls, sometimes repeatedly, um, until they have a son. Largely as a result of this practice, there are now an estimated 80 million missing girls in India and China alone. The large co cohorts of surplus males now reaching adulthood are predominantly of low socioeconomic status. Their unmarriageability and their atomization lead to antisocial behavior and violence, threatening social stability, stability and security. And so we see, as a result of two totally different gender systems, perverted in different ways by polygamy and abortion, the same national security outcomes in both China and the Islamic world, a permanent underclass of unmarried men with no prospects present a present and persistent transnational security threat which has caused spikes in human trafficking in all of the, all of the areas that I've mentioned. This is bad for men, worse for women, and worst of all for young girls. But what about the West? To paint a broad picture of um, vital rights in the West, every single Western country across the globe, um, we have seen in the past century a retreat from marriage. In many of these countries, the divorce rate exceeds the rate of marriage. This is also true for many Asian countries like Japan and Korea, but those just happen to be the most culturally westernized Asian countries. And in fact, in China, politicians have blamed what they perceive as a uh, sexual morality crisis in the country on westernization in the Western media. In nearly every Western country, the birth rate is below replacement levels, and of course, abortion proliferates. So what is the nature of the American gender system? What rules do we impose legally or culturally, explicitly or implicitly on men and women such that family life can continue in a productive and meaningful way? Well, whereas certain places in the Middle East consider women property, and certain places in the further East consider women a disposable commodity, the West seems to consider women men, ersatz men. Obsessed with the concept of equality, Western societies have for many years pushed for the elimination of distinction between men and women legally, in schools and in the workplace, but most importantly for the purposes of my research in the sexual realm. There's a lot I could talk about here, how birth control annihilated the consequences of promiscuity, how the secularization of society brought us the desacralization of the feminine on a symbolic level, how the debt-based economy makes people forego children. But to conclude, I wanted to make a quick argument for why the evisceration of the traditional Western courtship system and the abandonment of the notion that sex is reserved for marriage is actually creating a similar national security issue in America as it is, as, as I have mentioned, um, in China and the Middle East. Put simply, it's the incel problem. The term incels re refers to invol involuntary celibates, which is internet terminology for the phenomenon of the atom atomized, womanless men that I described earlier. Because of the crum crumbling of traditional social institutions that once enforced monogamy, we find in the West now de facto polygamous societies. Yes, polygamy is illegal, technically, legally, but, um, but we have sexual liberation. So in the West, people are free to experience sexual liberation to the extent that they so desire, and the only true standard for sexual interactions is mutual consent. What ends up happening in this society is actually extremely similar to the more extreme examples in the Muslim world. Wealthy men acquire loads of women um, who are newly unburdened by the expectation that they are the gate gatekeepers of sex, while the average or below average man finds himself outcast. And to the point about sexual gatekeeping, by cheapening the act en masse, <coughs> denying its consequences, and divorcing it from marriage, no pun intended, the incentive to marry evaporates. It's, it's like a thing now. People are like, oh, we're all, we're all the good men. Well, the incels in their alienation from society and their hatred of women are vulnerable to radicalization and tend to act out 
if they don't kill themselves first. Most of the high school shooters, actually, that we've seen over the past couple years fall into this category and participated in incel message boards on the internet. They view themselves as a community. So to conclude, if we are going to have a serious discussion about gender in this country and internationally, we have to be honest about the way that men and women, their purpose and their roles are distinct, as they should be. Radical equality breeds the same kind of radical inequality as overt misogyny, and it's counterintuitive. Um, I think there's a lot of room in sociology and politics to continue this kind of discussion, to reevaluate the new dogma of neoliberal Western democracy, and to think seriously about how, as a nation, we might regain stability in our gender systems and felicity in the family. All else follows from there. Thank you.